recording. So I have managed to lose my controls by doing that somehow. <laughs> still here with me, I can't see even who's on the call at this point anymore. Uh, yeah, I can. I can see you, Suzanne. You can see me. Yeah. I can't see you guys anymore. It's strange. And I don't have my con controls for the. Um... All right, just a moment. Apologies for the technical confusion here. Oh, I'm here. Oh, now I can see you. Okay, now I can see everybody. Okay, so we are recording. Um, thank goodness, thanks to the wonders of, of um, technology, I'll be able to <laughs> remove all of this back and forth. Um, so welcome everybody to the ISDO um, Telecon, monthly Telecon. I'm glad you're all here. And um, just to, to kick it off, the biggest critical activity that we need to request everyone, be sure you put on your radar if you've not already submitted, um, is the AGU deadline. So um, American Geophysical Union abstracts are due tomorrow by midnight Pacific time. And um, we've got a session for the ISGO community. Last year, we needed at least 17 abstracts to actually have a standalone session. And this year it will probably be more competitive. So we'll need, I'm estimating somewhere over 20 to 25 abstracts to be sure that we're able to have a standalone session. Otherwise they, they have you merge with other sessions. So get your abstracts in, present your work, and we will be, really excited to hear about it and eternally grateful because that means we'll get to have our own standalone interactions. Um, how many, how many do we have already? I don't know. Mariana, do you know? Yes, right now we have about six, but the majority of the people that I spoke with that are going to be submitting haven't submitted yet. So I'm thinking right. everybody's going to submit, um, between well, today and tomorrow. And just on this call right now, we've got 14 people already logged in. So if we could get folks to submit. One thing I was thinking about, and um, I'll, I'll tell, talk a little bit more about this in just a second, is that everyone who participated in the Computational Institute or the Training Institute last week, we could submit um, posters at least for every session or each of the major sessions and themes and those could be led by students who attended the, the um, workshop. So it's been a, a busy, busy time for ISGO and lots of exciting things are happening. A couple of the highlights are that will be called out later in the educational group discussion is that we just completed the 2017 Summer Training Institute for ISGO and it was in my opinion, very, very successful and very exciting. Um, we had about 23 participants and um, it was, it was, we learned a lot from one another and we've got a full case study and some data that we'll be able to hopefully start to share. And the start for a template of how to actually work through um, a workflow from start to finish. So that's exciting. Um, the NSF annual report is due and so I'll circulate that updated draft, hopefully, today or tomorrow so we can get it in pretty soon, but I'll circulate that around. And so let me know if you've got anything you'd like to report or have included in that report to NSF that's ISGO related, I will welcome any contributions. So I've been scratching my head and going back through notes to make sure I remember all of the things we've done um, from the start of the grant, which has been quite a lot. And um, the other thing is it's time for us to start looking forward strategically. We won't have time today to talk about that, but we're entering year two. And so as a group, it's time for us to steer ourselves towards some really thoughtful and purposeful actions together. So um, with that, I am going to uh, let each of the groups take over. And so I think that leads us into um, the AGU session. And Mariana, did you want to add anything else to the discussion of AGU? Um, I just wanted to open the invitation to everybody. We're going to go ahead and um, I'll post the link in our chat session so that you have a direct link um, to that. And I'll send out a reminder 
uh, later tonight so that everybody can see where they need to submit. Um, you can have one uh, where you're the presenter and then you can be collaborators in other ones. And so <clears throat> if there's other work that you've submitted, you can still, when you're a collaborator, you can still submit to our session. So we welcome your, your submissions, please. <laughs> I'll be submitting one, so. Yay! Thank you, Ms. P. All right. Well, so with that, um, Ime, are you on the line, and could you help us kick off the collaborative publications discussion? Yes, I'm online. Let me turn on my video. Just took a shower, so. <laughs> so um, I basically like at every meeting we try to go ahead and kind of update what what has changed in terms of publications. So I guess I, the first thing I just asked is, can any, does anybody have anything to contribute to publications that have happened since the last meeting, which was almost two months ago? Because I'm keeping track of those and post them on the wiki, on our internal wiki. Yes, Sudan. Um, Yolanda does, I think, for the CACM. Yeah, so, so I'm responsible for shepherding the CACM publication and uh, I heard back uh, from the reviewers. Uh, they said that the paper is very appropriate for CACM. That's a, an amazing feat already because it's a very general computer science publication and a very selective. So the fact that they want to hear more about ISGO is very significant. Uh, they also said that it's a little bit um, disintegrated, like it doesn't flow very well. Uh, so that was their biggest comment, and I think we can solve that. It's very hard to thread together so many ideas and so many things. And also, basically, what I did is cut down from the initial report down to whatever 10 pages they, they require. So that means that it's harder to thread things together uh, in turn. So I think we can solve those problems. Um, they... Uh, I think uh, they want a revision by August 15th, so we should have it resubmitted by that time. By uh, which so I'm by August 15th. Yes. August 15th. Uh, they also said that it it had it had a tone too much of uh, you know all the AI advances will be motivated by geosciences, so they wanted more of a tone of you know as uh, we think of cooler techniques in AI, can we bring them to geosciences uh, to do interesting things? So I think we just need to emphasize that uh, better as well. So, but uh, I think we're on our path to having it published very soon. What do, we, what do you need from everybody else to make those revisions? What do we need to do? So basically they're telling us that they don't need more voices. They need a uh, <laughs> unifying uh, voice. So I've asked uh, Vipin for help with a few things. I've asked Suzanne for help with a few things. So once we have it in a shape where I think it flows well, then I'll uh, send it to all the co-authors for final uh, comments. But I don't think that I need anything right now. Nice. And then I'll, I'll add a couple of things. So um, at the Earth Cube All Hands meeting, uh, Basil Tickoff and I spent a good portion of time, we spent about an hour and a half talking about the outline for the geosciences paper and feel like we've finally come to something that we can push forward. So I haven't been able to um, focus on that much. So I'll need to circle back with, with um, both Basil and Mary and then open it up for other people to contribute to. But I expect that won't happen until late August or early September at the, at the best, best case scenario. And one other um, thing, just as an announcement that I forgot about, um, we did just get a AAAS session accepted called um, Water Resource Sustainability, Artificial Intelligence for Water, Res Water Sustainability. That's it, that's the short title now, which is very competitive to get accepted into that. And um, it'll mostly be a panel of about three or four speakers and that's, um, Right now we've got Pat Gober and Yolanda is the chair and Mary Hill will help us with the dialogue session and Scott Peckham will present and Vipin will present. So um, that happens in February in um, Austin and we'll try to coordinate something around that same time that'll be a larger ISGO activity. Very nice. Anyone else? 
Well, we have something from the case studies working group. So we submitted a four page paper to the climate informatics workshop on the benchmark creation and the requirements of what, what constitutes good benchmarks and then a little bit about the first benchmark that we put together. So we submitted that last week, no, July 22nd. Uh, and we should hear about the uh, reviews should come back within a few weeks. So we should hear about that. And then the consensus of our working group was that once we have at least two benchmarks already out there and kind of have a little bit of experience what it takes to put them together and to advertise them, that then would be the time to make a journal paper out of it. And we had already talked to a journal editor and they were very positive about this idea. So, but we just have to say we need a little bit more substance of actually having benchmarks implemented before we can really talk about the whole process. And we also submitted, just submitted an abstract to the ISGO session on that. That's great. Okay, anything else before we move on to the next agenda item? Nope. I think we're done with this. Okay, great. With that, let's roll into the working group chairs. So data collection and integration, um, that would be Craig, David, or Enrique. So this is Craig. We haven't met, I mean, because I did the first two meetings and just didn't get much participation from the Jew side. So I think, you know, before, in order to reconstitute this group, I'd say we have to have, um, well, to be honest, I'm too busy to do the scheduling. So I, but I think what we really need is a geo person that's really willing to actively participate and is actually willing to help do the scheduling for this. I'm more than happy to participate, but I don't want to spend time scheduling it and not have people show up. I think one person we might want to talk to is um, uh, Patrick Heimbach, who was actually here the, at the end on Friday and came through. Um, he works here at the University of Texas at Austin, but he was formerly at MIT. And he does adaptive sensing and merges it, that information into ocean um, modeling. And I know that it's a, it's a topic that he's very interested in, and he would be a terrific geo collaborator for, for that working group. Okay, so we need a call for geo participants for, the, for that working group. So noted. Yes. And we'll Someone to organize it too, because I just don't have the cycles to spend time on the scheduling piece of it. I mean, I think I feel like partly it's my fault in terms of you know lack of participation, just because I didn't you know wasn't good enough at sending reminders and that kind of things, and I just don't have the cycles to do that. I totally relate. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll see if I can figure out something. I, I nothing comes to mind immediately, but I'll see what I can think of for that. And if anyone else has suggestions, they'll be welcome. And then Ime, you, um, do you, would you like to add to the benchmark cases in case? Sure. So we already mentioned the papers that we just sent to Climate Informatics. In addition, we put together our first, and that first had to go through a JPL review before we could have that go out and that went through. So now our working group is looking at it and giving feedback and Anuj has been really helpful. He's helped me to write a little tutorial on how to load the data in MATLAB and then visualize it and then include some plots in there. So we really can get, hand this over to computer science and say, here, you already have an interface if you wanna use MATLAB or otherwise it's very similar to, to implement that. And here are the questions we want to, you to look at and go with it. So, so the next step is just for our working group to give feedback on it, refine it a little, and then we need to post the whole thing, which reminds me of the fact that we still haven't figured out where we're going to post it. And I was wondering whether somebody has some good ideas. All the data, the data set is huge, but that's hosted only at JPL. So we just need something for a few, day, few files, a description, of course, something that's kind of visible and that we can use in the long run for other benchmarks too. I think this is something that we should ask uh, the education group to coordinate on. One, initially we can put them, we can create a page and a repository on the existing isgo.org uh, website and TAC can host whatever we need to host in terms of content. But um, longer term, one thing we talked about, and again, I think this is maybe an education group discussion item, is there's a, it's not good for the computer scientists though. Anyway, there's a, there's a program called CERC, S-E-R-C, and it's been run now for probably 15, maybe even as much as 20 years. And it's a curricular resource and catalog that geoscientists know to go to that catalog and you can find peer-reviewed, um, recognized, rated 
um, reviewed curricular resources. And I've been thinking for the, the materials that we've created for the 2016 and 2017 um, classes, we should put them there. And so that may be a place where we could leverage some prior NSF funding and a long-term um, known location online where people already go in geosciences to find information. Nice. I would love to hear more about this. And then so we're starting, we have our next meeting planned for next week, Thursday. Um, and one of the other agenda items is just to look at what, what the next, next benchmark should be. Uh, and one strong candidate is um, the hackathon topic from last year's Climate Informatics Workshop, because it's all in pretty good shape, is prediction. And I think it's, a, I actually was at the hackathon and it was actually an interesting problem, which we really didn't solve. So it would be nice to kind of package it up and have people work on it long term because it's one day things just don't get you that far. And it also brought up again, you know, writing this paper for climate informatics brought up again, okay, there are lots of things that are kind of related that we could integrate and just put something on top in terms of this quick start guide for computer scientists and also the description of the geoscience for computer scientists how do we bring all these people together? Because we, as ISG, we want to be kind of like the umbrella of lots of different things. So rather than starting something in isolation and somebody else does something in isolation, it would be great to bring all these people together. So we're starting to think about how we, can, how we could make this happen. So if anybody has more ideas, we can talk offline. Great. Let's see. Do we have um, Dan Fuca on? Nope. Okay. Uh, so Dan is the lead of the simulations group. And actually, I think that that group has also had a hard time getting started. Um, I will say, I feel like the training uh, session that we had last week led us at least down a good path for the start of um, the groundwater simulations. And I actually met today with um, Jeremy White from USGS, who may be on this call, I'm not sure. And um, we're going to try and leverage some an application that Jeremy pulled together and and also it's a previous NCAR application where we can actually share simulations online really easily using an open source um, server system called threads and um, we'll see if we can get that launched but it could be something that ISGO certainly can take credit for because Jeremy came to participate in this class last week and that's where we learned about his simulation tool that we can leverage so um, that's one possibility that may help that simulation group have something concrete to focus on. And then the education and geosciences group. Diana, are you here? Or Mariana, do you want to give a quick update? Yeah, Diana, um, I don't believe she's on the call. And as far as the efforts um, that we've had so far, there, there isn't any other participants. So if there's anyone that is interested in participating in this effort, um, please go ahead and, and let us know. And I really appreciate the suggestion um, of using CERC resources and leveraging that. Um, so we'll go ahead and I will work with um, EMA's group closely to see how we can move that forward. Great. And I think that the education group is, it's, um, the focus was on the class last week, so that's where the bulk of energy has gone. Well, can I, uh, can I? Yes. Yolanda, go ahead. Sorry. I, I just wanted to add something, which is that um, in the, the week last week was actually very exciting because we accomplished a lot of very concrete things and at the same time we opened a lot of directions for future work. So I think it will give uh, many uh, people in the community a place to participate. So one possibility would be to restructure the working group uh, that we have right now into the theme from last week. So, uh, so we just to go into a little bit more detail, we focus on hydrology. So I realize that that is not the interest of everybody in, in geosciences, but it might be a place to uh, see what we're doing in hydrology and transfer the ideas to their science. I think that would be useful because hydrology makes everything very concrete. So we did a lot of work in terms of using ontologies to describe data and to describe models. 
Um, we use Karma to show how to describe data sets and integrate them. We use a standard reference ontology called Geosciences Standard Names. We, um, we did work on describing real hydrology models like PIM and TopoFlow and ModFlow and PARFlow. Uh, and we uncovered many challenges. So if you think about it, this cuts across the topic of uh, our current working groups that do the, the sensor data, the modeling, uh, it kind of cuts across various things, but it's more on the topic of, you, you know, trying to use meaning to describe um, the different uh, elements of, of geosciences research. The, the second big area was machine learning, and we apply that to remote data. So I realized people have other interests uh, in applying machine learning. Um, uh, and I think there's a machine learning working group, but the work that we did last week could be something that is shared with them. Uh, and that's a working group that we keep. And the third big thread that we had last week was on workflows. So the workflows um, help compose models, put together models plus visualizations and so on. So I think uh, that's a very, um, you know, different way to look at modeling and other things. So. So maybe we want to, since we have all of these activities continuing to write the, the paper that resulted from last week, it might be a good idea to at least temporarily rearrange ourselves along these groups and give everybody my geo who was not there last week to, to remain integrated with these activities. I love that. I actually, you know, in fact, uh, just as a side comment for Craig, because he, he wasn't there, um, karma ended up being a really important um, motivator for conversations that happened throughout the week. We kind of kept returning back to karma frequently, it seemed, and there were a lot of active discussions. And so for the data collection and integration, that karma turned out to be a terrific tool that we could all wrap our heads around, oh, what it meant and and start to think about how it could be useful. So that was um, a big breakthrough, actually, I think that happened uh, among great. others. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. Yeah. OK, well, so uh, Yolanda, I think that's a great idea. And I think it makes a lot of sense about and making things concrete is certainly a lot easier. So um, moving forward, we've got just a couple of minutes here that we can leave open for conversation. Um, before we we start the the lecture, but does anyone have any response to Yolanda's suggestion? No pressure. I think it's great to restructure dynamically, and if there's a better way to put together working groups, let's go for it. I mean, if you have dynamics going, let's capitalize on on that totally. I agree. I, I think one of the challenges for the existing working groups is that maybe they're just a little bit too abstract for people to really sort of get fully engaged and say, "I want to work on this." Well, maybe that's it. If we restructure and use the content, because each, like Yolanda said, each piece of that, that training course had a concrete outcome and something that we can focus on now. And even just like the threads discussion with Jeremy, we've got these models that we can load up into it and it can be a public resource now for anyone in the state of Texas. And it's a lot of simulation models that are public and can be used as test cases or test um, components to a machine learning problem or to, gosh, almost anything really, scenario building, dashboard construction, you name it. So I can see how each piece really does inform a focal point for, the, for our community. I would love to keep my working group though because we're really going. So. <laughs> well, yours yeah, is I, think, <laughs> I think that's, that's one that we should keep for sure. And that one's been a good one. And the thing about it is, I think those case studies is, are the perfect entry point for people. Everybody, at least from the geosciences, we're all going to show up with our pet case study. We're all going to have our pet that we're going to want to be documented and to have it become the test bed. So um, that's a great way to get a geoscientist to engage. And then once, if you told me, come talk about data integration, I would look at you blankly and think, gosh, I don't know where to begin. But after seeing Karma, I think, oh, awesome, there's a data integration. I want to figure out how to do some of the online um, scraping of data from the USGS website using Karma. And 
I don't think it's that hard now because of what I learned about karma. So yeah, those concrete uh, approaches will be useful and more compelling for, for our side of this, I think, for the geoscientists. So with so that- it doesn't, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we can't have additional working groups also. Uh, so if, if other people have additional interests, I think that that would be fine. So we should make it clear that you know, anyone can propose other working groups if they're interested. I, I also want to say real quick for Ibrahim, that if you really saw how we're integrating hydrological data, and um, I, I think you would be, it's too bad that you were not there last week, but I think we should keep you engaged as much as possible. Sure, yeah. sure, sure, I'll be happy to involved. And I'm planning to attend AGU, so I'll prob probably present, uh, send an abstract to the Yay. IS session. <laughs> awesome, that's great. Great. A quick, Fantastic. Uh, and just, just if we have one minute, I wanted to mention for Sarah that um, uh, Talvi was fantastic and uh, we were talking a little bit about the kind of work that you do and um, I think she, she learned a lot from the meeting but my understanding is that you use a lot of sensor data and so maybe we can you know, have a conversation about um, how to include your work in some way with uh, with the working group. That sounds good. I'll I'll be at AGU as well. We perhaps we could discuss there even more, if not before. Wonderful. AGU may be a great place to do that. Wonderful. Uh, okay, one, sounds oh, great. One final thing, I want to throw out a challenge to the early career group. We're going to AGU. You will all be there. You all. Traditionally, we go and have shakes um, in San Francisco after the session, but this year it's going to be in New Orleans, so we don't know where to go. So I would charge the early career working group to figure out where the ISGO community gets to go post-session to celebrate and have a milkshake together. I, I'd like something ice creamy and milkshakey in there. Malts are good. Something New Orleans-y. You, you, <laughs> gotta, you gotta go for beignets. Ooh, I don't even know. I've never had one. I don't even, I've never been there. <laughs> gotta have that. <laughs> awesome. Okay, early career challenge. Um, and then we should do something useful aside from eating. Eating's very useful, but aside from that. So I'm going to turn it over now to um, Danielle so you can introduce Kiri for us, um, our guest speaker. Sure. Um, okay, so today we have uh, Dr. Kiri Wagstaff, who works at JPL, and um, uh, we invited, well, I invited her because she gave a talk at ISI, and I thought that um, many of the things that she was working on were very relevant to, to what we are doing here, because she was mining, um, like, target locations from the literature using uh, machine learning techniques, and also given given that, uh, well, many of you guys, many geologists are also interested in using these kind of techniques, um, I, I thought that it would be very, very interesting uh, for you to hear what she has to say. So, um, yeah, that's that's all on my end. Uh, Kiri, when, whenever you want, you can start. All right, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me here today and, and for Daniel to have set this up and made this connection. I, From what I know already of this group, it seems amazing, actually, and I would welcome the opportunity to be more connected with you even beyond today. Um, just to share, uh, just yesterday I was having a conversation with a student from Cal State Fullerton. I had gone there to give a talk to their geology department, and um, she was so excited She's finishing her master's in geology, but she wants to go on and do another one in data science. And she said, I never knew there were people working at the intersection of geology and, and data science, and, and how can I learn more? So I've already pointed her to the website and resources that you, you've provided, but um, there's a lot of interest out there. I just wanted to share that. Um, so, okay, in terms of the work I want to share today, let's see if I can share my screen here. And let's see, are you able to see my slides? Yep. Okay, I'm seeing some thumbs up, that's great. <laughs> um, so this will be an abbreviated version of the talk that I shared at ISI. Uh, some of you, of course, have already seen it, but what I'm hoping is that you'll feel free to interject with questions or 
um, comments along the way. Uh, this is more about starting a discussion. So what I'm focusing on here is at the intersection of planetary science and information extraction. Um, and so that's a lot of the work we do here at JPL is, of course, working with data from other planets and specifically Mars in this case. Uh, this is joint work I've done with Raymond Francis at JPL and several very talented USC um, master students who have now graduated, including Thame Gauda, who's now at ISI with Yolanda, and Karanjit Singh, who's now at Apple. Um, other researchers, including Stephen Liu at JPL and Ellen Ryloff at the University of Utah, who you may be familiar with from other NLP work. Um, this is focusing on data that's collected by our rovers on Mars. Um, and then going beyond that to publications that are written about that data that's collected by the rovers on Mars. So it's helpful to understand a little bit about that cycle of how the data gets to us. So we send commands to our rovers on a pretty much daily basis, telling them what data to collect. And here you have a visualization of the ChemCam instrument on the Mars Science Laboratory rover, which is this amazing instrument that can Literally, this is an artist's conception, but it does what's shown here. It zaps a rock or soil with a laser, which turns it into a plasma and then uses a spectrometer back on the rover to assess what that rock was made of. Um, it can give you individual elemental readings for whatever the target was from up to seven meters away. So this gives us a huge capability to study targets without having to roll up to them and actually touch them. And that data comes back down to the Earth um, we look at it overnight or during the day, depending when that is, and then formulate a new plan to send up to the rover so that it can continue collecting more data. And for MSL, this has been going on for <clears throat> um, almost five years now. And for the Mars Opportunity rover, it's been over 14 years. So this is a cycle that goes on and on and on. Um, and it collects a vast amount of data. So I've listed two data sources here. Not sure, do you actually see my pointer if I point to things? Awesome. Um, so the Planetary Image Atlas stores, of course, image data being sent back from these rovers. Um, the MSL rover alone has, you know, half a million mass cam images, 1.5 million has cam and 7 million or 6 million nav cam. Huge archives of image data, as well as the spectral data I mentioned before from ChemCam. There's also a site called the um, Analyst Notebook that's been created for each of the rovers that organizes this data in a little bit easier to browse form. It gives you a chronology of per day on Mars, which is a SOL, what was the plan, what were the science objectives, what data was collected, and now what does that mean in terms of the traverse the rover has followed. So there are these the tools out there to try to get you to access the data with some context, but we don't have a central location that tells you what you've learned about the targets over the years and so in this case more than a decade for opportunity of data collection. So there are questions that people are asking about these things that just simply cannot be answered right now. To give you a little more sense of what these targets look like, these are a collection of the drill targets that the Mars Science Laboratory rover has created on Mars <clears throat> by drilling to get into the interior surface of rocks. And I'll point your attention to the names of these targets. Each target is given a name. Um, some of them are things like Buckskin or Big Sky or Mojave, which are named after Earth locations. Not because they have any resemblance to the Earth location, but simply because there is a need for convenient names. So we just reuse them blindly in these Mars locations. Um, John Klein was actually a person that this uh, got named after, not a location. And so you can start to get a sense, and I could show you, but I won't go into detail here, but if you wanted to know about what we know about the target called Mojave on Mars, a simple Google search is not going to get you there. Um, there's too much overlap with Earth names. A search on Confidence Hills isn't going to get you there. Even if you add the word Mars, you really don't get to the information about these targets because it's too specialized and it, too, it overlaps too much with other, um, the names are all ambiguous. So that's unfortunate from a sort of CS or information science perspective that they didn't simply name them target one, target two, target three, but that is what we have to deal with. So given that um, ambiguity, if you would like to know something about these targets, like which of them contain fluorine or plagioclase, which is a mineral, or even is there consensus in the scientific community about what is known about a given target? 
You simply can't ask those questions right now. And that's frustrating. So you're, you have to fall back on reading a whole bunch of papers and trying to synthesize your own view of this. The information's out there, if only we can make it easily accessible. And that's what's motivating our work on this project, which we call the Mars Target Encyclopedia. We are um, aiming to automatically build a searchable database that gives you exactly that information. What do we know about a given target? Where is plagiocles being found on the, on the surface of Mars? So we built this interface, and first I'm going to show you kind of how it works, and then I'll get into a little bit more about the methods we use to populate that database, which is the interesting sort of information science part of it. So here you can search by target, or what we call a component name, which is um, an element or mineral in this case. So if you search by, there's a target named Dillinger, it tells you we found this target. In our database, we know seven things about its composition that came from three different scientific publications. You can click on that to drill down and see what those actually are, including the fact that it contains fluorine and potassium, and if you scrolled down, you would get more of these. And so we don't just assert that it contains these things, but we include the excerpt from the scientific publication, including its citation, that supports that conclusion that fluorine is present or potassium or so on. So um, as a user, you can actually quickly see all of the relevant tidbits where this target was mentioned, and if you'd like to see more context than just one sentence, you can click through to the full PDF for this source. So that gives good traceability and credibility to the content inside this database and allows you to drill down. It also allows completely new kinds of searches, like if you search for hematite, a mineral, it will tell you there are nine targets in this database that contain hematite, and in red are the points where they are found along the rover's traverse of Mars. So you can start to see if there are concentrations of where things are found, or if it's spread out, if it's rare, if it's common, and so on. I will note, however, this is talking about the world of publications that have been indexed into this database. In this case, only about 100 publications. This is not the full set of the scientific world, and so the lack of an uh, appearance here doesn't mean it's not there. It just means it's not in the publications that we've analyzed so far. And notably, it will only appear in publications where it was considered publication worthy. So hematite will only be mentioned where it's maybe surprising, unusual, in high concentrations, and so on. So this is really getting you to the, the scientific goal, the, the information that scientists have found valuable enough to publish to the research community. But it's not meant to be comprehensive. Kind of an important subtlety that we've struggled with how to really correctly convey that to everybody. Um, I, I now want to show you some pieces about how this works, but any questions about what we're trying to do here? I'm happy to address those. And if not, I'll assume you all, oh, go ahead. Is that Yolanda? I was just going to say, this is really interesting so far and right on target for the things this group wants to think about. So, terrific. Great, great. That's good to hear. Um, <clears throat> I'll next talk about uh, a little bit more on the technical. I'll have, I'll have one, one small question. Ah, go ahead, Daniel. Um, when, you, when you were showing the targets, uh, we were seeing that, yeah, each target has a name, but they also have an identifier, right? So the problem is that people don't refer to those identifiers, they just use the names in the publications? No, they, they really don't have identifiers at all. There is no standard identification. Let me go back real quick here. Um, uh, it's because maybe I got disoriented because uh, you know I saw I thought that the site forty five uh, comma zero minus blah 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 meters right. were, was like the identifier, but that's not the case, right? That's right. We would love it if um, so. This information is known, but it is not synthesized into a unique identifier for each one. We would love it if people did do that. And in fact, there's been um, I think that's going to change for the Mars twenty twenty rover, which is the next one going, because some of the people who've been working with this data have, have elevated this issue to the fact that we do need these ident unique identifiers, which would greatly improve our ability to trace them through the literature. Um, ultimately, of course, they could have something like a DOI, you know, or a, some kind of object identifier, I mean, not DOI, but some identifier that everyone would consistently use. What we actually find in the literature is not only do they not have that, but even with these names, 
they don't get consistently used. Sometimes if it's two words, people put an underscore between them. Sometimes they misspell them. Sometimes they kind of make a variation. We also find a lot of abbreviations. So telegraph peak might be referred to as TP for, um, to make it easier in the publication. So even when there's an identifier, you find there's a lot of uh, variants that pop up, which is vexing for you know, information extraction purposes. Okay. So, excellent question. Um, a related, so related to that, then, how do we actually pull this information out of these scientific publications? So we built this system that takes in a, P, a set of PDFs on the front end, um, processes them through, and turns them into a database of, of compositional information that those PDFs contain. And we've broken this into a, a sort of traditional approach to information extraction, first by finding entities we care about, in our case, elements, minerals, and targets, these Mars targets, and then trying to infer relations between them where you say that a target contains an element or a mineral. And that's what we're really trying to pull out, just that one kind of relationship alone for this database. Um, looking first at the entity extraction, I won't have time to go into these in detail, so again, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. But just briefly, this is a process where we process all the text and we try to find where those key um, uh, entities appear. And in this case, we're using Stanford's core NLP system, which uses a machine learning classifier to classify each word or token within the text as one of maybe perhaps many classes of interest. And it comes built in with the ability to recognize people, locations, organizations, and so, and so on. But you can extend it by training it with your own text where you've given examples of elements, minerals, and targets. And so that's what we did here so that it could be adapt to the planetary science literature, not just the, the default classes. And to do this, we used um, uh, documents from the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which happens every year. Every year they publish about 2,000 of these abstracts at the conference. It's kind of like AGU, but for planetary science. I don't know if any of you have attended LPSC. Um, and each of these abstracts is two pages in length. They're not allowed to be longer, so they're kind of bite-sized publications. And they're not peer-reviewed, which is important, of course, for the quality of the information we're getting out. But they're very accessible, you know, publicly downloadable, easy to work with, and that's where we started with our, our process here. So we used data from three years to get about 6,000 documents, and then manually annotated those documents that talked about that ChemChem -chem instrument I've mentioned before. This is the one that's generated the, the largest number of Mars targets on the planet, so it's a good place to start. And of course, it's looking directly at compositional data. So we annotated by hand about 100 relevant documents and then turned it loose on the rest to find more interesting and re relevant information. Um, we do have a target list, uh, a known list of these target names, so that, that gives us a, a starting point. But again, because they're often ambiguous, one of them is the word link, um, one of them is the word Ithaca, unfortunately, because a lot of planetary scientists come from Cornell University in Ithaca. So we get, if you just blindly annotate whenever you see a matching target name, you're gonna get a lot of spurious matches that aren't talking about Mars targets. But it is something we can use and we did use here as a starting point. Here's what our manual annotations look like. We used a, a web text annotation tool called Brot, which is really amazing and easy to use, but allows you to click and annotate targets, um, minerals, elements, and other things that are in the text, and then make a link that gives that compositional connection between them. So we could generate quickly a lot of training and evaluation data uh, without you know, unduly ta uh, uh, draining our expert knowledge here. <laughs> uh, we had a planetary scientist who actually works on the ChemCam science team provide the annotations for us. So, Kiri, what's the name of the tool that you used for that? It's Brat, B-R-A-T, and um, it's, I, I found it to be extremely useful. It saves the annotations out in a separate text file, so it's easy to inspect and see what actually got saved but it gives you this nice visual display of the information um, that's much easier to work with than just trying to match you know, text spans across different documents. Uh, as you can see, sometimes it, it can get cluttered and complicated when you've got multiple relationships on top of each other, but mostly we found this to be pretty useful. 
Thank you. So then um, uh, some quick results here. We trained this on documents from the 2015 conference and then just tested it on 2016. And we, we used as a baseline a heuristic approach that takes the, we know what element names are, right? There's periodic table. We know many mineral names out there, although it turns out there's more than 6,000 unique minerals, so it's quite a large set. And of course, we know what the target list should be according to the mission. So if you take those, um, along with some heuristics to help you avoid some of those spurious detections, you get the performance in these orange um, bars. And actually pretty good performance across all three of those classes. And then we compared that in green to the core NLP machine learning approach, which doesn't have the advantage of, so, so the heuristic approach has the full list of known names, um, but can't generalize to new ones because as new targets are discovered and named, they won't be in the list yet. The machine learning approach tries to learn from the patterns of how those appeared in the 2015 documents. So it can generalize, but it doesn't have the full list of targets to blindly apply. So it tends to suffer in recall, but be better in precision. Um, and so we can see here, it's pretty comparable for the element and mineral classes, but it's not performing as well in the target class, largely because it simply, it, it doesn't get enough information about the full set of target names, and a lot of them are very ambiguous. So we're still working on that class. And ideally a way to hybridize that, to take advantage of our known lists in conjunction with the learning and generalization. And, um, we're still working on that. But overall, this performance is good enough for us to proceed with working on the detection of the actual relations of the compositional information, which is the key that we want to get out of for our database. So now I'll quickly talk about that step of this process, where we try to find the relationships between targets and elements or targets and minerals. And here we again use the machine learning approach um, we use this JSRE package, which is designed to look for relationships between words in within a given sentence. So one limitation right off the bat is it will not find relationships that cross the sentence boundary. And so that's something to keep in mind. But it uses a lot of um, uh, language specific features about part of speech, uh, bag of words and local context and global context to try to decide given a pair of of these tokens, one is a target and one is a mineral, say, uh, is there a compositional relationship between them as indicated by this sentence, by the content of this sentence? So a human would read the sentence and say, yes, we are saying that Confidence Hills contains plagioclades. Um, and we'd like the system to be able to do that with as high fidelity, ideally, as the human. Right? So again, here we have a baseline approach, which is a simple thing where we say, if a target and an element or mineral appear within the same sentence at all, that's already a huge clue that they might be related. So we'll just say yes. We call this the all yes baseline. And um, if we can't do better than that with learning, then, then we have a problem, right? So um, that's in orange. And then in green is our, our learning system. And I'll just point out, because I found this interesting. Originally, I was training a classifier to detect and classify target element pairs and then separately target mineral pairs because we thought they might have different manifestations. And those, we were able to improve over the baseline, but you can see these F measures are still about 0.5, so they're not amazing. But then when I simply combined them and allowed it to leverage one classifier that could look at target related to either an element or mineral, the learning um, improved by a lot. And the heuristic method performs about the same, but we really leverage a lot from just having more training data and being able to generalize. Apparently, people do, in fact, sort of use similar language when they're talking about these elements and minerals as, co as compositional elements within the, the target. So that was an interesting discovery. But we're still at about 0.6 here, so there's still room to grow, and um, we're working on that as well. Um, what we have done is, again, as I said, trained on about 118, in this case, documents and all of these an manually annotated components, and then applied that to the almost 6,000 documents in the entire conference for three years. And I can show you that we're extracting a whole lot of information there. Uh, what I can't tell you is how good it is, as we are currently still working on doing a manual review of these extracted relations to see what their quality it truly is from an expert perspective. 
One good thing though is that it does save us a lot of time. We determined that it takes a human about 30 minutes to read one of these abstracts and pull out the relevant compositional information. And that's an expert, so it takes a lot longer for the average person. <laughs> Um, but of course, so the uh, automated processing, it's about five seconds per document. It can very quickly zero in on the relevant information. Um, I have a couple of examples here of some of the kinds of extractions that we get out from the system for, on these new documents. So you can see that it is finding this target named link, even though that's a pretty ambiguous, potentially ambiguous word, unfortunately, and connecting it with hydrogen and potassium and so on. And I won't dwell on this because I don't want to take too much time here. But note that there are several incorrect annotations as well, where if we're here it thinks Cumberland contains carbon because it sees the abbreviation for carbon here. But you know, obviously as a human, we're like, no, that's talking about temperature. So there's refinements that need to be made there as well. Um, in terms of where we're going, we are working on doing that expert evaluation of the extracted information and supporting multi-word targets because often they do have two words and as I mentioned that adds ambiguity in how they're described in the text. For We want to support relations that cross sentences um, and really our goal is to have a high recall on the entity detection stage. We want to find as many of those as we really can and then have high precision on the relation extraction step because there, if we have information in our database that's bogus or not reliable, that's exactly the way to lose people who might potentially be users of this database. So we would rather have an incomplete set of information that's highly reliable than a more complete one that has garbage in it. And I think that's the right um, guidance to have for a lot of this type of applications. So I'll just close there. Um, again, I'm happy if you have questions about any of the elements we're working on. It is a work in progress and I definitely welcome uh, suggestions or feedback on it. Thanks. Great. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Um, presentation. I have a I have a, a question. Um, but well, but well, I have already seen the presentation. So if yeah. anyone else has another question, uh, then I'm I'm happy letting them go first. Um, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so so I'm Riza. Uh, it's my first time to join this uh, conference. I'm I'm from the University of Manchester, um, and I'm working in. Uh, I, I belong to the text mining group. So I just have uh, well a question and maybe uh, some feedback on the NER, the the name entity recognition. So I will start with uh, because um, Kiri, you commented on how you want to improve the performance for targets um, and you said that one of the things that you would like to do is to somehow incorporate the dictionaries in the in the machine learning based approach in core NLP basically um, I was just wondering is it not possible to include dictionary features in core NLP um. I'm not aware of a straightforward way of doing that, but I would love to know if there is. Um, uh, the, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just wondering because um, I've never used Core NLP personally uh, myself, but but uh, I mean I've used other packages which are also based on the same algorithm, which is conditional random fields, um, CRFs, and That's other cool. yeah, and there are other these other packages they they can incorporate dictionary feature so basically how it how it works is like if you have a list of terms that you're interested in like for example your list of targets right so basically the feature is just a boolean saying that okay this token is a match with this um, term in the dictionary and then it kind of you know um, enables that feature and that fits in into the CRF as well. So I, in other domains, I've never worked in this domain before, but in other domains, it, it, it works quite well. Like we get um, an increase in performance if we incorporate that feature in the CRF. So yeah. maybe that's something to look into. Yeah, thank you for that. I will I will look to see if Core NLP supports that because um, it would be great to just fold it into what we already have. Mm -hmm. The direction we had been looking at was something called data programming which mm -hmm. is designed to allow you to use ideally multiple sources of dictionaries, even if they're incomplete, mm -hmm. and allow you to then also do learning on top of that. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so far, we haven't found that to work super well with the target class because unlike things like um, if you're trying to extract last names or mm -hmm. locations, we really only have one dictionary source, that, which is the missions list. Um, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, so if we had multiple sources, they can kind of vote, and then that's what data programming leverages really well. So mm -hmm. I think it, it's definitely worth digging deeper with Core NLP and see if the dictionary feature is something we could enable. That would be great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, um, and then the other is just a question about, I'm just interested how many annotators uh, you have for, like when you produce the, the, the manually annotated corpus of yeah, 118. In this case, we used a single annotator. We worked him hard, but that meant oh. that the annotations um, ideally are, are very consistent then because they're done by a single person. I see, um, yeah. Yeah, in, in reality, we worked him even harder than that because we, uh, we had to make a couple passes over the documents. If you have an experience with this kind of task, it, it's true even for the annotators that as they see more data, they realize they like to go back and change things. Um, that yeah. they earlier, right? So so he's made a couple passes over those 100 documents, um, and, <laughs> and we're very grateful for that. But yeah, so far I imagine it's a very tough job, I imagine, for him. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, yeah I guess oh, I, um, that, that is uh, right, that you can, because you see, usually what people, what other groups uh, try to do is like, they employ multiple annotators, right? And then they, 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 they work independently, but some of the efforts, they try to define a, a common subset, like, you know, this subset will be annotated by these multiple annotators, just so that they can measure the agreement uh, between the annotators. But, but like what you did, which is like one annotator, but as you said, two passes, um, you know, the, the people also do that to measure something called intra-annotator agreement, because yeah, you're, you're very right that sometimes, you know, the, the next time they have a look at the same data, they actually kind of, you know, become inconsistent or they try to, to correct things. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's, that's also a great approach, although, as you say, uh, probably you, you worked him really hard. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. That, that whole issue of how to generate label data for both training and evaluation is a really thorny one. Um, yeah. We, we uh, since we only had about 100 documents that were relevant for the ChemCams to start with. Um, mm -hmm. We were kind of reluctant to carve out, you know, for the documents needed for an inter annotator agreement study, which would be, I don't know, like 30 of them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's it's still there to get a good sense of how much they agree with, they'd have to do a lot of the same work twice. And yeah, so we yeah. haven't got to that stage. Um, okay, but, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to. I know that uh, Daniel also has questions. I don't want to kind of, you know, <laughs> take up all the time. So yeah, thanks. Sure. No, I, but, I, but I will add to that because I actually find this very interesting and important. Uh, when, when Raymond, our, our expert, made his second pass over the documents, mm -hmm. we found all of our performance went down. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> because he was being way more thorough. He was marking every little thing that he thought could be relevant. And that was, I have to say, you know, from, from this side, a little disappointing, but realistic, is that he, he had made kind of a cursory pass the first time, maybe. Uh -huh. uh, the second pass was more thorough, and therefore the recall dropped. So, uh, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's I a see, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you, thanks very Thank much. Thank you, great that. comments. So, are, are there any questions from the GEO side? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I think you so, can ask your question, Daniel. Oh, sure. And I have more, but that's fine. So, um, <laughs> we wouldn't have, I mean, it's, uh, having one annotator is great, right? Because you, you have the consistency. But um, on the other hand, wouldn't uh, you, you be like a little prompt to, to the bias of that annotator for, for, for that particular corpus? Yeah, you would. Um, and our hope was that since he's a member of the science team for ChemCam, for the instrument that we're actually trying to support, that whatever bias he has should be a good thing. It should, <laughs> it should hopefully reflect what the scientists on that team actually consider important. Um, and I, I do have a second person on that team lined up who is willing to do some annotations. So one of our questions is, you know, how, how well would her annotations match with his and is that bias really consistent in the team? Okay. Absolutely. And, uh, 
you were you were mentioning also that you were using one particular classifier. I was wondering if the precision or recall would improve if you just used a different one. Have you tried several? Uh, do you mean um, for the entity part that we're looking at here? Mm -hmm. Like where we use Core NLP, the CRF that's built in there? Uh, yeah, well, before you mentioned that you were using SVM for for detecting something else as well, right? That's right. For the relation extraction, it's an SVM. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as usual, one could explore different methods and they have kind of different strengths. The nice thing about the SVM is you can define custom kernels between structured data. And so that's already been done for this JSRE package. So it allows it to work with the text and, gener um, and extract these as listed here, these interesting features which aren't um, as amenable to a lot of methods that require numeric features or things like that, right? So any kernel-based method, I think, would be a good fit here. But we haven't explored anything beyond just this one so far. Uh, okay, well, I was just curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question. You don't want to be too attached to one method, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, those, those were all my questions. Yeah, good questions, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyone have any other um, comments or questions? I, I am wondering, so how can we give the feedback back to the groups that are naming and collecting these data sets so that they can follow a standard way of identifying their locations? Um, well, I, I alluded to this a little bit, but I am definitely heartened. Um, so I mentioned briefly Fred Califf here on this slide, if you can see it. He's the one who's doing the mapping of these targets. So he's like the GIS connection from the targets to their locations and visualizing that. And he's leading the charge to say, guys, you need to have standardized IDs so I can map these, ideally including that site location and so on, those other metadata components, just build that into the name. And instead of these, you know, cutesy names that are not useful from any sort of identification perspective. And he told me that he has prevailed for Mars 2020 for the next rover, that they are going to adopt that as a recommendation. So I'm really excited. Honestly, what I think will happen, though, is that they'll end up with two names because the culture yeah. now is that it's, it's fun and appropriate to name targets fun names, and people like doing that. So I, I'm afraid that may continue at the... We, we may still have this problem now of linking the real ID with the cute ID. So it's hard yeah. to... <laughs> But that feedback is happening, and I'm very glad it's not just me making this point, it's others too. I have one question, but it's, it's the whole group. So given that we have at least two people with text my interest right now, Key and Razor, and there are lots of people who are involved in similar things, like Daniel and Yolanda, is there any kind of sense of a working group that would encompass that kind of stuff, but extend beyond text mining, because text mining would probably be too specific? So I have a I have a comment on that from the class that we had last week, which is at the very end. We had we had several incredible conversations. So for example, there was a machine learning conversation where we literally were picking apart the scientific uncertainties and assumptions and um, kind of uh, elements that we could apply the machine learning to inside one of the equations that we use for recharge in our model. And that was with Vipin and his group. But at the another one that I I just found to be transformative was the conversation on the last day. Everyone's brains were very tired, but it was with uh, Deanna Pennington and Yolanda, and Misty was there, and I think James Collins was there, and um, it, we were all sitting there talking about. Um, how we're representing uh, data trends in dashboards and things. But Misty from Kansas University put up a, um, a dashboard that she's got that actually has a description along um, the side panel. So one of the side panels is a text description that explains what is important, what are the important trends and relationships that are displayed in the panels for some time series data in this case and a map um, alongside. And what we were talking about was this idea that Yolanda mentioned of um, qualitative modeling and how you could use qualitative modeling with enough pieces of information and, and examples to start to um, teach an algorithm potentially to reason about those trends and start to then eventually identify them on its own. And so that, to me, was one of the most fascinating conversations to come out of, out of um, that week. And, it's something that I think could benefit from the text mining as just a starting point, and I suspect there are other ways. I think it'd be 
fantastic to have a working group look at these issues and ideas together. Suzanne, I put the link in the chat, so if anyone wanted to look at that. Thanks, Misty. And uh, I also think there is a connection to Scott's work because after all, what uh, Kiri, Kiri is doing is mapping uh, what, uh, what are the names that uh, people use in the different papers and referring them together, right? Which is what Scott is doing for, for the different models. So it's a different thing, but it's just this uh, standard way of relating um, heterogeneous stuff together that that I think is it's it's really well it's really in common. Yeah, that so that's Scott Peckham who's doing the geoscience standards na standard naming. Um, I guess is it an ontology that he's developing? Is that what you would call it, or is it more of a mechanism for naming that? It's both. Yeah, it, it's an ontology. Yeah, uh, ontology plus a mechanism. Um, <laughs> a mechanism for naming. So you were right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, Amy, I think there is some interest here. Um, I think the question becomes bandwidth and uh, how do we start the engagement? Um, you so you want your paper to be really enthusiastic about and get it off the ground, right? Yeah. <laughs> so at the end of the session, we have one or two people who really want to take the effort and make it happen. Um, Risa and Kiri, how are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm happy to to engage in, in in you know in those things. Yeah. Well, maybe we could do um, a couple of emails. Maybe we could just have a, a teleconference call for the people who might be interested in engaging with a work, working group to look at that the mm -hmm. topic, and um, and just kind of brainstorm from there about how the group could move forward. How does that sound? Sounds yeah, great. The, yeah, sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see, in terms of action items and how we coordinate that, um, I'm going to ask if someone would like to volunteer to be the person who does a doodle poll or some kind of organization to get that set up. I love it. Everybody's quiet. <laughs> I'm giving you time to come off mute. <laughs> All right, going once, going twice. I will, um, I will try to send out a doodle poll and try to set up a, a meeting. I'm, I'm gonna be honest, if it's on, on my schedule, it won't happen until next week or the week after probably. So I'll put a reminder on my calendar. And Suzanne, you already have so many things on your plate. We need somebody else to step in on the long run. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can use initial call just to see whether you guys can come up with something that's kind of interesting and cohesive enough for everyone, but then somebody buys into it and takes over. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. A final plug for AGU. Uh, call your friends, find all the brilliant people that you love to work with and ask them to submit an abstract and email. Yes. I had just one more point. I mean, the question of identifiers came up again and exactly the same when we were submitting the paper to the climate environment workshop, I got exactly that feedback. I think, I don't know who pointed me to it. It's like, yeah, think about identifiers for your benchmarks. And so I looked at oh. Yolanda's geoscience papers of the future paper, and it all comes back to identifiers because otherwise you cannot do intelligent search or anything afterwards. So I keep on thinking what, what this group can contribute to and all the systems out there that we can use and then really offer to people or, you know, for benchmarks, I'm even wondering, you know, I still have some money left to hire some undergrads. Should I hire some undergrads to go out and see, look at, at data sets that we could transform into benchmarks, give some identifiers, give some quick start guides and get them out there, you know, just to, to reduce the fragmentation in the field. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I know that in the EPA, for example, when you do water quality sampling, there's a really, I still name my samples using the EPA um, hazardous waste um, methodology. And it's, you know, you number it, you've got a location identifier, and it's just, there's a sequence that you put in, and it's kind of the date and the time and the place and a, and a unit number for the, for the, the sample itself. And um, that got so ingrained in me when I was younger that that's just the way I automatically number all samples from this, you know, today. And you well, know, we keep the system early on, but we don't. We come up with all these new things and we don't give some identifiers, and then we're stuck, right? So, so my question was just, what can we contribute in terms of frameworks? 
that's a, another question for another day. <laughs> All right, Kiri, thank you so much. I will, um, I will, yes, it was great. I will edit it. I will uh, edit down the video so that it's just your presentation. And then if you don't mind sharing your slides with us, if, if you don't mind, if we'll post them on our website. Um, they are hopefully going to provide entry points for people into interesting topics. So um, this is going to be a terrific one. Yeah, should I just email that to you or Daniel or someone? Yep, either or. Yep, either. That's fine. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank great. you for this. Thank you for having me come. This has been really great. And like I said, I, I would love to have more connections with this group. You guys sound like you're doing excellent work. That's really important. So I'm sold. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, Daniel, maybe can you respond with how she can sign up for the list serve and. Um, sure. and Okay, awesome. Everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, sorry to, to run a little bit long, but uh, best to all of you. Please email with any questions, comments, or thoughts about things that ISGO, the RCN can and should do. And um, don't be shy. Let us know if you'd like to present at one of these monthly telecons. So everybody take care and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.